I'll wait for the cat down. Welcome to this afternoon's session on content accessibility in Drupal. My name is Simon Shackleton. I'm the director of Doghouse Agency, and we are very pleased to be sponsoring today's session. Presenting today from Salsa Digital is Philippa Martin and Danielle Scheffler. Um, so first of all, Philippa is a content writer and engagement manager with over 25 years experience in content writing. Um, it's a lot of experience. Um, Danielle is a pro product manager and business development lead, former roles in accessibility as a practitioner. With over 15 years experience, Danielle has developed accessibility practices with multiple organizations. Um, over to you guys. <laughs> All right, so uh, as Simon stated, I am Danielle Scheffler, um, current product manager and business development lead at uh, Salsa and um, former accessibility practice lead on a consulting basis. Um, I started out uh, with accessibility in around 2006 or so. Uh, I was a Java developer, and uh, at that time, there wasn't a lot of talk uh, about uh, accessibility, but I was working um, as a contractor for the federal government and uh, just really interested uh, once I found out you know, that sites had to be accessible and, and what that meant, and that really just started me uh, on the road to learning more about accessibility development, design, uh, content, all things. Um, and I'm very excited to um, get to share my knowledge with everyone. So, um, Philippa? Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, um, I came from a marketing comms background um, and ended up specialising in online writing in the early days of the internet. Um, so I followed all the early usability testing by Nielsen and a bit later came across the accessibility standards uh, that apply to content. Um, in terms of writing, there's actually a lot of crossover too between writing best practices for usability um, and for accessibility. Uh, which means that often when you're making sure your content is accessible, you're also improving it for other people as well. That's me. So today we're going to talk about um, obviously the web content accessibility guidelines. We'll start off with a brief introduction, even though I'm sure most of the people in the room today um, know all about WCAG. Uh, and then we're going to look at the specific guidelines that cover writing uh, and also the guidelines that cover multimedia. Uh, and Danielle is also going to take you through some of the Drupal tools that are available to improve content accessibility. Uh, so in terms of um, WCAG, W3C's Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, uh, and we're currently on version 2.1, provide an excellent and industry approved standard for website accessibility. Um, and accessible websites can be viewed and easily understood by everyone, which is why they're so important. So one of the things that we wanted to cover, because I think uh, a lot of you have probably heard uh, A, AAA, uh, or sorry, AA, AAA, and, and aren't maybe entirely sure what that means. So uh, level A is really the smallest amount of effort that you can do. And, and really, while it has an impact, so we certainly don't want to uh, negate anything there, it does have the lowest impact uh, on the presentation side and, and back end and, and just business in general um, for your site or application. Uh, level uh, AA, which uh, really a lot of people hear mostly about because, as Philippa said, while uh, WCAG 2.1, uh, or you might hear WCAG 2.1, um, you know, is really the latest standard, uh, while there is 2.2 and 3.0 uh, coming up soon, um, you know, 2.1 uh, helps with responsiveness and uh, just really more uh, disabilities in terms of cognitive, um, you know, motor, um, really takes a look more uh, at that piece 2.0 um, is and 2.0 AA, I should say, is really where a lot of the uh, regulations across the world um, are really focused. And so um, level AA, just so you understand what that means, really has a very high impact on users, whether it's WCAG 2.0 uh, or 2.1. And of course, has the higher impact uh, on that presentation layer, um, code, all of those things. Um, and it's why a lot of businesses choose to focus there. Um, some of it is because it's a regulation, but of course, uh, really, we're not doing this just because it's the law. We're doing it because we want to make sure that everybody has an equivalent experience uh, as much as possible. 
Um, and then the other uh, third level is uh, level triple A. And those um, requirements and, and guidelines we will talk about uh, later on as well, but they tend to be for very, very specific user populations. Uh, some of those, and, and it goes really more into development as opposed to the content side that we're talking about today, um, can be very difficult to adhere to. Uh, W3C even mentions that <laughs> themselves. This is in our language that's actually from W3C. Um, and so with that, uh, that is the reason why you don't see uh, as many asks for that or uh, why, you know, there isn't as much uh, chatter, I should say, in the global community um, about AAA. So instead of just uh, talking about, uh, you know, these different levels, it's good to give examples. Um, again, you know, we have the user impact on the left side um, and then on the right, just giving a few examples of, you know, how things kind of go from one to the other. Um, so we'll talk about this um, guideline 1.3.1 info and relationships later on uh, in the presentation, but just generally it's saying that there should be some sort of structure, right, to your uh, page and, and to your site. And I say page because accessibility is um, reviewed per page. It's not done, you know, on a whole site level. Um, you do have to look, you know, kind of template by template. Um, and so with that, it's saying, you know, you have to, you know, make sure that you have headings, right? There's navigation and a footer, you know, you want to use bullets and lists, um, those types of things. So that's really the, the first part, and that's level A. When you get down to double uh, A, that's when you're saying things like 2.4.6 for headings and labels. So it's not just that you have a heading or that you have a label, it's very purposeful, it's descriptive, you know, it really um, has a bit more impact. And then even though AAA might be talking a little bit more about, you know, paragraph text and things like that, you know, does apply to other, you know, pieces of the page as well. So could apply to headings or, you know, things that are in bulleted lists, et cetera, but making sure that the reading level is at an appropriate level. Um, and Philippa will uh, explain a little bit later what that means, but you can see kind of how we go from, you know, level A to uh, level AAA based off of what those um, standards and guidelines are. Uh, so I will turn it over to uh, Philippa to get us started about um, some of the uh, specific guidance. Yeah, so looking at the first level A one, um, in terms of the um, WCAG, it's 1.3.1. Um, and Danielle had mentioned it before, um, the actual specific guideline is that information structure and relationships conveyed through presentation can be programmatically determined or available in text. Um, so from a text point of view, um, it's things like ensuring that each heading looks like a heading. Uh, obviously, that comes across into design and front end, of course, um, and also um, doing things like when you're using lists, making sure that they're the, the proper ordered or unordered mm -hmm. lists, um, using description lists to enter into the WYSIWYG editor uh, with the appropriate start and end tags as well. Okay. So the next one, WCAG 1.3.3, .3 uh, sensory characteristics. So instructions provided for understanding and operating content do not rely solely on sensory characteristics of components such as shape size visual location orientation or sound so what exactly does that mean because right that's a whole lot of information <laughs> there so basically it's saying you know don't um use something like uh you know click on the chime in order to uh move to the next page or click on the green arrow uh to go to next or uh, go to the middle of the page to do, you know, X. Um, it's the fact that not everybody will have the ability to uh, maybe understand those directions because of a cognitive disability. Uh, it might be a visual disability because they, um, you know, aren't able to maybe see the content as well or, or at all. Uh, it could be that there's an auditory issue and so they won't be able to hear the sound. Um, and so it's something where and we see it on form fields, right? Where um, a lot of times, um, you know, instead of right using, uh, say, just a red uh, outline for an error, we also have text that displays what the error message is. Um, and so it's not saying that you can't, you know, use some of these um, characteristics. It's just that they have to be in uh, conjunction with something else to really help, um, you know, everybody be able to, you know, operate the page or or to get the information that they need. 
Uh, back to me now. Um, so the next one is page titled. Web pages have titles that describe topic or purpose. So this is WCAG 2.4.2. Uh, and basically what it means is that you need to make sure that all of your page titles have that um, unique and descriptive title so that if someone reads that page title, they have a good understanding of the information they're going to find on that page. Um, the good one about this one, I mentioned that a lot of these um, WCAG are actually also um, good web best practice anyway. So with page titles, you have the added benefit of um, actually providing people who are scanning readers. Obviously, if you you know they scan the page title, that's a very important element. People will usually first read the page title. Um, and the other thing is obviously a good descriptive page title is also going to really help with search engine optimization. So here we've got that, as I said, sort of that win-win where you are making your content accessible. Um, but also providing benefits to all users. Uh, the next one is WCAG 2.4.4, um, and that's around link purpose in context. Um, so with this one, it's a bit of an unusual one. Danielle and I have uh, <laughs> spoken about this a few times, but um, with this one, it says you can use click here if you've got context around it so that people are aware what they're going to click on. However, with this one, there's another one um, that's the, the next level up from A, which is so easy to do with this one. So I would even recommend, although this is level A, you can meet level A by um, just ensuring you have context like, you know, you may want to read the article on blah, blah, blah by clicking here. Um, there's an easier or a better way to do it um, as well. The next one is labels or instructions. Um, so this obviously largely um, uh, goes to forms. So you want to be able to have instructional text at the beginning of the form so that people are aware what they need to fill in and also um, instructional text for each field so that they are aware what fields there are, what are the required fields, et cetera. Okay, so we're starting to get into uh, level AA now. So uh, WK 1.4.5 uh, images of text so if the technology is being used, can achieve the visual presentation, uh, text is used to convey information rather than images of text, except for the following, customizable or essential. So things that are considered essential are things like logos, um, really hard, right, to use uh, text as a logo. And so, you know, W3C, right, the, the guidelines understand that. Um, the thing is, is that Right. We, we know that there's CSS. Um, it, it is pretty easy to make sure that we're using uh, text instead of an image. But the reason why we really don't want to do this is for multiple reasons. Um, some of it is SEO. Some of it is because, um, you know, if, of course, there's responsive design, right, and, you know, different devices. Um, we know that images, right, can generally be resized uh, based off of the screen. But if there's, uh, you know, text in that image or, you know, as the image itself, not as easy to uh, resize that. There's issues with uh, translation. Um, there might be the case where uh, somebody's uh, browser isn't loading because of a slower internet connection or something's going on and they aren't able to get that image to load at all and it might be important content. So um, that's really where uh, we want to uh, make sure that we're just using text uh, if we can. And the next one is headings and labels. Um, and this one, 2.4.6, is just to say that they're descriptive, um, that they specifically describe the topic or purpose. So for example, and this is where we can get, um, you know, there is a little bit of subjectivity here. You know, is this heading descriptive of the whole page or of the section of the page? Uh, so there is a little bit of subjectivity there, but obviously the main thing is that when you're thinking about headings for your page, that you're really focusing on trying to keep them nice and short and succinct, but also making them descriptive. And the same for labels. So for example, labels from forms, etc., should also be really descriptive and let it make it clear what the purpose of that heading or that label is. So the next piece um, is around uh, images of text, but this time, no exception, right? So uh, again, when it says no exception, there really is an exception. Uh, <laughs> there's still an exception when it comes to logos. Um, so making sure that, um, you know, you're not uh, taking this out of context because of that. Um, but, you know, in the um, piece for uh, regular images of, of text where we see at a lower level, um, it does say that if, you know, it is able to be customized, it's okay. Um, in this case, it is it is not. Um, when we get to WCAG uh, 2.4.9 for link purpose, uh, link only, 
this is exactly what Philippa was talking about um, with level A. So um, because of the fact that with screen readers, a lot of times they can, or not a lot of times they can, <laughs> um, pull out a list of links to help people navigate a little bit better. Um, you know, if, if you have a whole bunch of click here and read more, not only is that generally not the best usability uh, because of, you know, ambiguity, but also I'm sure all of us, right, if we were using a screen reader, would be very confused if we're listening to links and, and you know, pulling things out and just hearing click here, click here, click here, read more, read more, read more, view more, view more, view more. Um, and so if you've seen some of my um, talks previously at, at Drupal South and, and Drupal Gov, you know that um, I've given some methods out to how programmatically um, to make sure that we can take care of that. But again, also from just a content perspective um, and writing in a WYSIWYG editor, et cetera, um, or just you know having a, a content editor author um, who is able to assist um, in creating you know some of those um, or some of that link text or suggestions, um, really wanting to make sure that everybody's getting uh, full context. Uh, yeah, I think this is oh, where. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, no, I was going to say this is where I mentioned that it's really easy with this one to go from that level A to triple A um, for a content editor just to write in that very specific. And um, that's why I said I have, you know, literally for 15, 20 years, I've been trying to, you know, single handedly get rid of click here's, but they're everywhere still, although they are becoming less now, which is great because it is such an easy one to change. It makes it so easy for um, for people who have their websites to get them from um, A to AAA, um, at least on those links. And so it's a very easy implementation. And our next one here is 2.4.10, uh, which is section headings. Uh, so it's a little bit more, um, I guess, a higher level of compliance than the early one that we talked about with headings and labels. Um, but it's, again, um, making sure that obviously as well as those titles being descriptive but you're actually using the headings to organize the content so that means you know you might have a page and you might have um, five h2s and a couple of h3s so those next level down of subheadings and it helps to organize the content um, and again this is another one where you get that win-win um, because you know, there's been a lot of great research um, even some recent ones by the Nielsen Norman Group. I'm sure that uh, any people listening who are into UX or design will be very familiar with uh, Nielsen Norman. Um, but basically, you know, they've done some a lot of research in the past and some more recent ones on eye tracking. And it's quite clear that most people, because they're scanning a website page, um, they do scan those headings. So if you can break your copy um, into those meaningful headings, it will really help um, the users. And again, helping users, every user, and also making sure that you get that AAA compliance um, for accessibility. Oops. Uh, the next one is 3.1.3, uh, and this just uh, relates to unusual words. So basically, if you've got a lot of jargon or, um, you know, very um, tech-specific words or other words that are specific to an industry, that you have a way that the person can get a definition. So that may be um, a link to a definition or it may be having the definition within the content itself. Um, and again, generally for um, any form of writing, uh, you know, any, any writers in the room will know that we're taught from, you know, from very early age in terms of corporate writing um, and writing for the online medium to make sure that we um, try and get rid of those unusual words and, and use some of the simpler words um, so that anyone can read the content. Uh, similar abbreviations, very same, a very similar um, thing that if you have an abbreviation there, that you either have the expanded form or that you have a meaning of it or definition of the um, abbreviation available somewhere as well. Um, the next one's a really interesting one, 3.15, is reading level. Um, so with the, um, this guideline, it's actually saying that your reading ability uh, should be lower secondary education level, meaning that anyone with a lower secondary education could read and understand your content. Um, and obviously that's quite low. I'll just pop to the next slide. And um, just in terms of how to do that, well, I'm going to come back to, um, to some of that reading level at the moment, but just I also wanted to, before we move on to that, you know, obviously talking about these, um, the WCAG uh, guidelines, it's good to have an accessible version because obviously there's quite a lot of detail. If you actually go into them, there's, you know, a lot of information on each of these guidelines that we've covered. But what does it actually mean? What's the easy or the accessible version? simply choose your page titles carefully 
Um, by carefully, we mean writing descriptive, succinct, but descriptive. Uh, write contextual links instead of click here or read more or more information. Use descriptive headings on your pages to organize copy and to show hierarchy. Uh, you know, those are read out, that hierarchy is read out by screen readers, so that helps people also identify the, or, the organization of the copy. Uh, keep instructions and error messages clear and easy to understand. Um, and where you need um, instructions, do them, you know, in the form fields, make it clear for people what they need to fill out. And then the second one, back to this writing for a lower secondary school education. Um, and in fact, although WCAG says um, lower secondary, so that would be sort of year seven to eight, um, the Australia's Digital Transformation Agency um, says year seven. Uh, so a lot of people will be saying, how do I know what, if what, what I've written is year seven or year 10 or what it is? There are actually a lot of tools, some free, some not. Um, this one that I've got here is a free one. Uh, so Danielle's driving, she'll just open that up for you. Um, and as you can see here, you can put in some um, content. This is some, uh, you know, one we prepared earlier. Uh, and so have you clicked the readability there? Uh, yes, it's down here is what it uh, had showed me. Yeah, I actually can't quite read that one on my screen. Um, but when you um, click the readability, it actually tells you what year level it is. And so therefore you can sort of see, okay, this is what year level this is. This is too high. So I need to start changing my copy in a way to make it more accessible. Uh, so that can be done simply by, um, in this case, I've got in this example, I've got one that's got, oh, here's our readability, sorry. Um, one, um, just cutting one sentence into two. So it's as simple as that, that's all I did and it can bring it down significantly. Okay, just back to the presentation now. Um, in terms of how to, how to keep that um, reading level as low as we can, um, it's really a matter of doing things like choosing simpler words, keeping your sentences short with a single statement per sentence. So as I said, even splitting one longer sentence into two or three sentences, using the active voice, avoiding jargon, which as I mentioned also, um, is one of the WCAG guidelines, um, and also making sure your writing is well structured and to the point. Now, obviously, all the things on here, we could do a whole presentation on those, but that's not what we're here for today. Um, so I will move on um, and just show you some of the quick examples and let you know that you can actually get quite a long list of replacement words. So this is a very quick example of, for example, approximately can become about. Um, endeavor can become try. So this is getting rid of so, some of those longer words and using shorter words instead. Um, and on the um, government style manual, which is used by um, obviously governments, but also um, most corporate organizations um, will use it within their content areas. Um, and you can find a whole list of words that um, you can, that are sort of longer, a bit more verbose and how to replace them with those easier words, which will help your readability as well and the reading level. Okay, um, over to Danielle again. All right, uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, multimedia in general. Um, I know we have a little under uh, 10 minutes, so going to go through these uh, fairly quickly, uh, but uh, WCAG 1.1.1, .1 .1, uh, non-text content. I'm sure a lot of you know this as uh, alt text. So we wanna make sure that um, there's descriptive alt text for every non-decorative uh, image. Um, so. One of the things, for example, we see in manual testing is, uh, or I'm sorry, in automated testing is, yes, you have an alt tag, uh, no, you don't. Um, this really is making sure that in order to pass, it's something that's very descriptive. So someone who maybe can't see the image or the image isn't loading, um, that they really understand uh, what is in that particular image. Um, and we do show that uh, alt can be uh, empty for decorative images, right? Because sometimes there are images that are uh, just there for, uh, you know, visual appeal. Um, and then the other thing to mention with this is that we really need to make sure that charts and graphs um, have a long description, um, or if it's something very basic, it can have alt text, but just making sure that you're not trying to have that chart or graph stand alone um, and, you know, provide the information solely that way, because again, if it's not loading or if somebody can't see it, um, then, or maybe, you know, there's a cognitive um, disability and, and maybe they're uh, not sure how to process the information, um, having something to describe it is extremely important um, for providing that equivalent experience. 
So uh, audio only and video only. I know this is a lot of text information. So <laughs> this is really to make sure uh, for everybody who wants to go back and uh, you know read it after uh, we're finished. But essentially, uh, audio only, it's just making sure that there's something available um, so that people you know who maybe can't hear it understand uh, all of the text, all of the music, all of the sounds, you know, that there's some sort of audio uh, description available for them uh, that really kind of tells the, the story um, of that media. Um, and then the same thing in terms of uh, video only, you know, we want to make sure that there's a transcript of, of what's happening, um, you know, when it's audio and video together. Again, we want to make sure that there are sounds. It's clear who's speaking. Um, it's you know one of those things where if, um, you know you you have your sight and you closed your eyes, for example, um, you know that you would understand uh, what was happening on the video. Or if it's audio, if you you know had something uh, you know where that you wanted to access, but your computer was on on mute. You know if if you don't have a hearing disability, um, that you would be able to understand. Um, and again, same thing with with cognitive disabilities, etc. Uh, want to make sure that um, everybody is able to accurately process the information. Um, so captions, um, I think most people are aware of these, um, you know, even though they come, you know, I'll say out of the box, right, with a lot of third party providers, it is still extremely important for whoever is in charge of those videos. So, you know, if it's a video, you know, editor, if it's your content person, whoever it is, um, making sure that those captions are accurate. Um, I actually had tried to turn on our captions, um, you know, through Google uh, as we started. And I think half of it when Simon was speaking was incorrect. Uh, and that is exactly why, you know, you need somebody to go back and uh, make sure that those captions are, are accurate. Um, again, this is talking about a full text transcript um, and audio description. Uh, just very quick story, you know, that I, I wanted to mention about this. Um, I actually found a good example as, you know, we were creating this uh, presentation of The Lion King. Uh, for those of you who have seen it, you know, in the beginning when Rafiki takes uh, Simba from, you know, his mom and goes to show him to the rest of the, you know, animal kingdom. Um, some people might be like, okay, Rafiki picks up Simba and shows him to the rest of the animal kingdom. That is not right what an audio description or media alternative does. Um, it really was talking about how Rafiki picked him up, you know, how he, you know, walked over to the rock ledge, how he, you know, lifted him up, that the zebras had their hooves going and that the antelopes were, you know, bowing down and right, all of those details and those, you know, sounds and everything else are extremely important to put into the content. Um, and so again, that's why, you know, as we talk about, you know, some of the Drupal tools, um, it's super, super important to just keep that in mind that, you know, all of those tools uh, that we have are not going to find some of these things. Um, and so it is very important from the content side that those are included. Um, so again, this is very similar. Uh, this one I wanted to touch on very quickly is extended audio description. Um, I did put an example down here for um, everyone to read, you know, at a later time, but it's essentially just an example of a professor who's, you know, sketching and explaining, you know, a physics problem. And so having something available where, you know, because he's speaking so fast and he's drawing um, that, you know, and that he erases and he starts the next thing is making sure that there is a pause in the video um, and that there's more description and, you know, more audio and, you know, that somebody who needs it is able to really gather all of the information um, and then it started again. Um, and so this is part of AAA, um, but right, there are instances <laughs> where this is uh, needed as this example shows. Um, and then this one, the media alternative, it's not just a transcript, it's not just an audio description, it's really just, you know, full play-by-play -play of every uh, visual and auditory um, piece that's going on in uh, a synchronized media. Um, so it does become very, very long. But again, remember that there are specific user populations that might need this. Um, so where are we in Drupal? I know that Philippa and I talked about a lot of this, um, but I think it's really important in terms of the content and understanding that piece to understand how everything comes in uh, from the Drupal side. So this module, if you have not heard about it, is like one of my absolute favorite accessibility <laughs> modules. Um, it's called Editorially. Um, and again, this is something that is automated. Um, so it's not something, again, that will cover everything manual, but it is very important um, and very useful for 
content authors and editors um, after they go in to add or edit their content uh, in Drupal. What ends up happening after they click on save, they get similar to what is a preview button. Um, and then they end up getting, you know, either everything passes, uh, they see alerts, warnings, maybe a little bit of both. Um, and then very, very, very specific uh, information here. And so um, this is really helping everybody understand um, exactly, you know, not just what the problem is, but why, but really helps further our accessibility education, um, which is super important <laughs> um, team. So I think it's just really important that this is coming out in the community um, and that, you know, as we get to, to D10, right, hopefully as we get even further than that, you know, that we continue to have more tools like this. Um, it's not just about, um, or I'm sorry, it's just about content though. It's not trying to replace your wave or right. Some of you might use Axe um, from DQ by itself. Some of you might use um, Lighthouse, which has Axe as its core. Um, it is not meant to replace um, that. It's just, this is very, very specific. Um, and then also, as you can see, there's even pieces here that talk about, you know, Here's the heading and, you know, or sorry, here are headers and then goes through just step by step um, all of the different pieces. One of the things that I did want to show as well is all of the different, you know, kind of um, tests and checks that it does. Um, so we can see that it follows that info and relationships, non-text uh, content. Um, you know, it's looking at, you know, some of the other things we talked about with links. Um, but again, I'm going to stress it again, as if I haven't said it enough, um, that it is very, very, very important uh, to remember that this is uh, automated and that, you know, yes, it will check your alt text, but it won't actually check that it's, um, you know, completely uh, accurate and, and super helpful. Same thing with captions, things like that. Um, and so, again, I truly see that um, there's been a lot of work with editorially. Um, we're going to see, I think, even um, greater, you know, opportunities within this space um, within D9 as well as um, D10. And um, there is a lot more accessibility work that is happening within the community. Um, you know, we're not trying to make uh, more automated tools. There are so many out there. Um, so know that if, you know, especially from the content space, you don't see, you know, three, four, five more modules, you know, coming in with editorially. That's because right at a certain point, again, there's only so much automated testing that you can do before you have to do the manual piece. Um, but this is a module that I would pretty much recommend uh, everybody if you, you know, are working with content authors and, and editors or, you know, personal site, whatever it is um, that you uh, focus here. Um, and then the last one um, to talk about um, before we uh, get to questions, um, just very, very quickly, is Site Improve. I think a lot of you might know Site Improve as an SEO service. Um, they do a lot. You can see that they have page analytics here, um, but they do also have uh, an accessibility uh, piece as well. Uh, please note that for this Site Improve module to work, you generally have to have a subscription to uh, Site Improve as well. Um, so it is a little bit limited um, and why, you know, I would suggest more of um, editorially. Um, but other than that, um, just really quickly to point out, you know, you can see broken links, uh, they even do misspellings, uh, different types of errors, um, and then you can see SEO here as well. Um, so. Uh, keep looking out in this space. Uh, and last thing um, is if you would like to uh, contact uh, me or Philippa uh, or reach out to Salsa, um, here's our contact information. Um, I will just leave this up here for 30 seconds. Um, and uh, I think we are ready for questions. Fantastic presentation, guys. Um, very uh, consistent number of attendees, which means that obviously everyone was very, very engaged. There's a lot of insightful information in there. So. Um, so congratulations, well done. Um, guys, any questions, just throw them to the Q&A portal. Um, we've had a couple of questions come through. Uh, the first one is from Robert Trans. So what is the best practice for dealing with accessibility on images and graphs? So I know that's a quite a talked about sort of subject. How do you make graphs and charts accessible? Yeah, um, who I could probably do a whole presentation on that. <laughs> So I think it's really just making sure that the information that you have, um, you know, is in the right formats, um, right? Sometimes alt text is not going to be enough when it comes to some of these charts um, or some of these graphs. And you might have to have, you know, a whole 
um, you know, paragraph of text or, you know, something right where there's a uh, somewhat of like a transcript for your graph and your chart um, in order for people to to understand. So uh, I hate sometimes using the phrase, it depends, but in some cases it depends, right, on how much information you have. But if, you know, a, a long description, right, if you feel like, oh my gosh, I'm going to need, you know, five paragraphs to explain this because it's really complicated research um, or something of the like, then, you know, uh, there are options, right, of the transcript, you know, is it something where you make a descriptive like video that has, you know, captions and, you know, do you need an, an audio description instead? It's really just um, making sure, it, it, let me back up. It's really all about making sure that users can get that uh, information in an equivalent manner. So um, any of those options uh, will work. It just depends on the complexity um, of what you're working with. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of modules, especially in Drupal these days, obviously have the ability to review or look at the actual raw data sets. So is that, do you think, I mean, is that generally a good accessible way of actually presenting data you know, visually people want to engage with the graph, but visually impaired people can't engage with the graph. So right. is, is presenting the raw data accessible or what are your thoughts around that? Um, gen generally, yes. Um, again, yeah. it's it's kind of hard to answer without being able to see every individual case. Um, but yes, generally that yeah. that should should work, but you know, it's uh, it varies. Yeah. Um, so just on, I guess, look, WCAG's what, 2008, I think the guidelines were initially published. So, um, you know, doing my quick math, that's about 13 years ago. Um, the Australian government, my understanding the Australian government has used WCAG to sort of inform uh, policy around the Disability Services Act. Um, so, you know, over the last sort of 13 years, how has WCAG evolved from, uh, you know, as a standard? Yeah, I think that's I think that's a great question. So I think the good thing is that you know we've seen um, 2.1 right, and you know as I had uh, been able to throw in a little bit <laughs> is that you know it really opened up for a little bit more of you know thinking about mobile and you know thinking about more disabilities around you know the cognitive piece and a little bit more about motor. Um, so 2.2, uh, uh, I know that they keep pushing it back, um, but should be um, available, hopefully, uh, early next year. Um, and so we're starting to see even more changes there. There will be a huge change in WCAG 3.0. Those standards are already starting. Um, you're going to be getting away from like the A, AA, AAA. Um, it's not just necessarily going to be, you know, you pass, you fail. Um, there's going to be a whole restructure um, which I think will really help open up accessibility and in terms of the understanding and, and the education, you don't have to be like a developer that understands every single piece of how a site works in order to, you know, focus on accessibility. And I feel like that's where we have issues now, or, I mean, look at how many, um, you know, standards that Philippa and I talked about today, right? <laughs> There's so many. Um, it's really kind of breaking that down a little bit into a much more understandable way um, because mm. the disability community is not only getting a lot more focus, but I think a lot of people are really starting to understand that accessibility isn't just for disabilities. I mean, so many, you know, people in the world, you know, like you're big numbers on the iPhone, right? Or people who use captions when they're, say, working out at the gym, right? And they're, you know, watching a, a video or whatever else, um, they're useful for everybody. And so we are seeing that really big um, shift, um, which I, I think is great. Yeah. I'm actually really excited. And I was just going to say on that as well, I mean, you know, there are, there are things that, for example, that reading age, you know, there's been um, research that's been shown that even people who are um, you know, PhD educated, they still, when they're online, enjoy reading things that are um, written for that year seven, year eight age, because it's easier and faster. And we're often in a rush online. It's just the way things are. And I also wanted to comment in terms of how it's changed. Um, I think it's also important to note that although it has changed a lot, there are also some things that have been in there from the start. You know, there are, um, you know, guidelines in terms of content that, as I said, I've been following since the early days. And so I think there is a lot of stuff that has changed and that has uh, has grown, but there's also stuff that um, has remained consistent throughout that time. And that's a testament to the, um, how important it is um, to, to make sure that the content and other areas, of course, but from my perspective, content is meeting those. Um, um, I'm also minute. aware that, Oh, sorry. sorry, I'm also aware we don't have much time left. And um, just in case we don't get another chance, I also wanted to um, 
thank everyone from, for coming along and, and being involved in this session. Um, you know, obviously accessibility is something that Danielle and I are really passionate about. Um, uh, and my focus is more the content accessibility. But yeah, I wanted to thank everyone for, to, for coming along and to thank also Doghouse for being the sponsors for this slot as well. So just in case we get timed out. <laughs> Well, 38 seconds left. I'm not quite sure. We can probably try another question, but um, okay. probably not. Uh, if you want to, so just quickly, uh, writing accessibility content. So you've touched on SEO before. So how does SEO relate to accessibility? Um, it doesn't. Seconds? It doesn't necessarily relate. It's more that one of the things here yeah, in in 15 seconds. So you know, one of the examples I gave was the page title. Um, a page title, if it's really descriptive, it meets accessibility requirements. But if it's descriptive, it's also going to help your page come up in a Google search because it's um, if that's what the person's looking for, it's a good match. Oh, one yep, second. Fantastic. And I think we're out. All right, guys. Uh, looks like we've been extended. Um, thanks again. Very informative session. Um, there's a lot of wealth of information in there, and um, you know these these presentations do take a fair amount of time to put together. So um, you know, thanks for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of the conference. Bye.